Um, what do you see with uh, fasting? People who are doing a lot of fasting, you know, extended fasting, mm -hmm. even the intermittent fasting, how are their numbers looking? Because everyone always kind of preaches about how fasting is going to be this magical cure um, mm -hmm. to lower those numbers. And for me, I actually saw <laughs> kind of the opposite. Um, it was when I was doing a lot of fasting and intermittent fasting, like very strictly that I saw the higher fasting numbers and I saw the numbers kind of shooting up overnight. Now, again, that could have been higher protein, but I was cutting off my eating window every day, five o'clock or earlier Then I wouldn't eat again until, you know, noon or one o'clock the next day. Mm -hmm. And I still had those like super high, you know, okay. for, for being yeah. keto or, or carnivore, what I consider to be high numbers in the 90s, mm -hmm. hundreds. Um, so what are your, what are your thoughts on that trend? Yeah. So you were eating about a four to five hour window. Mm -hmm. okay. Six, but definitely not anything more than a six hour. Yeah. That tracks with what I've seen. So, uh, I have a lot of things to say about fasting, <laughs> but so what was interesting is going into this before we started actually seeing customers data, you know, digging into the research, doing everything we can to build up educational materials, learn everything we can. And there's not a lot of information about healthy people and continuous glucose data. And most of this research that's been done on fasting has been done on men, right? Women are excluded a lot of the times from research because we have periods and that makes us complicated. We're, we have, that's what I try to tell people all the time is like in your, when you're in reproductive age, there were actually a bunch of laws that were yeah. created so that you cannot run a lot of medical tests on women of reproductive age because they don't want you to get pregnant and be in this clinical trial and then have a risk to the fetus, you know? Yeah. I don't think women really re like understand that. Yeah. Most people are not digging deep into the actual, you know, yeah. methodology of what the research was. They're just looking at the quick conclusion. Um, so that's the first problem is that most is done on men or postmenopausal women. And then there's this huge gap in between where it's like, okay, this doesn't necessarily apply to me then. Um, I don't know if you follow Stacey Sims at all, but yeah. she always says women are not yeah. small men. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Yeah. I love that because it's like, okay, yeah, we're not just a smaller version. We have completely different physiologies and that's important to take into account. So back to fasting, um, there was no evidence and the research that showed that it was going to be bad for women, but there were a lot of researchers coming out saying, I, I'm a little concerned about fasting for women. Like, you know, there were some red flags. So I was concerned as a healthcare practitioner recommending it too much to our customers. So in the beginning, I was very safe. I was like, no more than 12 hours of fasting for women a day because I wasn't sure. I didn't want it to give a recommendation that was negative because there really wasn't great evidence for women. And then over time, as I started to see hundreds of people's data, and even though that was our recommendation, they're still going to do fasting the way they oh, want to yeah. do, I could start to see clear nuances. So I almost never, I probably can count on one hand, seeing a male respond poorly to fasting, either intermittent fasting or extended fast. So seems to be that the benefits outweigh any potential costs for men. Um, but I don't see the same thing for women. Mm. So almost always like a 16, eight intermittent fasting. So at least eight hours of fasting a day, everyone seems to respond pretty well to that. So that seems to be generally safe for most women. If you are underweight or have an eating disorder, still would not recommend any type of fasting because that's just not a good idea, but that's a very small percentage of the population. So in general, I feel very safe now recommending like a 16, eight to most people. Um, that seems to be kind of in line with our natural circadian rhythm and way of eating. When we start to get an eating window shorter than that eight hours, that's when I start to see mixed results. I would say like half of women respond poorly to that, specifically with OMAD style. So one meal a day with women, I see a lot of mixed results. So I see some women respond well to it. And then I see some women where they, when they're fasting, you know, they're at 20 hours of fasting at this point, we should see glucose nice and low, like seventies, eighties, and their glucose is 110, 120. Yeah. That is a red flag. Like that is defeating the whole purpose of doing the OMAD style of eating. If your glucose levels are at, at that level and they're eating keto or carnivore, we should never really see it at 120. Right. So, and, and that was happening a lot over and over specifically with women doing OMAD. Doesn't seem to always work for people. It seems to be that it's more of a stressor than yeah. helpful. 
Um, so we have this different level of stress tolerance. All of us have a unique level of stress tolerance, but women tend to be a little bit less than men and then some women even more. So if you are already under a lot of stress, um, you know, maybe type A personality or you have a lot of stress going on in your life for whatever reason, then usually not a good idea to make that fasting window super short because you're putting too much stress on your body. Mm -hmm. Stress is a U-shaped curve and we start to get to that negative stress rather easily when all these other stressors are compounding. So for the most part, I would see women who were maybe had some sort of metabolic dysfunction, like really high fasting insulin levels, or they're very overweight, have a lot of weight to lose, or maybe pre-diabetic. Um, extended fast seem, seem to work really well for these women. Um, I think the stressors from these conditions and metabolic dysfunction are more serious than the stress from the fasting. So for those women and men, it seems to be really, really helpful in getting the insulin level down and that glucose level down fast. And so it can really help fix these broken processes. But for somebody who's a normal body weight, normal standard lab values, they're trying to do you know, a 36 hour fast twice a week or they're doing OMAD, it's really not necessary and it's just putting more stress on the body than, it's, than it needs. So those women I'm seeing a lot of negative effects for. So. It's sort of a, a fasting checklist. Um, I want to make sure, you know, you're not underweight. Your body fat isn't less than 15% as a woman. Your chronic stress and your sleep is under control. You're not severely caloric restricting either. Um, if, if you're really low calories for whatever reason, that's also a stressor. So if yeah. you're eating really low calories and doing a lot of extended fasting, not a, not a good combination. And if you're sick, if you have some sort of infection or illness, not a good time to be doing a lot of uh, fasting either. So it's kind of a checklist. And then 16-8, generally good practice for most people. Awesome. Yeah, you know, something I've seen with OMAD also, you know, the one meal a day, um, that those people, it's kind of like you're trying to cram your day's worth of calories into one meal and you mm -hmm. kind of get used to um, eating a lot in that one meal, kind of almost like overeating in the one meal. Cause for me to get all my day's calories in a one meal, I have to eat till I'm pretty much stuffed. I'm just not mm -hmm. used to that. And people get kind of used to doing that at every meal and say, you know, your, your willpower breaks down. Cause for me to do OMAD is like a ton of willpower. Um, and you, you know, have the second meal. And so I see people not only like having all the stress and the elevated, um, blood glucose from doing OMAD in the first place, but then also it's like you got it, you eventually your willpower breaks down, you have that second meal, or you just have to eat later in the day, and then they end up gaining weight. So um, I definitely don't recommend uh, OMAD <laughs> to women at all. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's important to know yourself. Like for some people, I think it really simplifies decisions. They're like, I only have to eat once a day. I don't have to think about food then. And that's great. But a lot of us aren't like that and we're thinking about food still during the day. And it's, and yeah. so know yourself. Are you the type of person who you think that this is going to be more helpful or more hurtful? Yeah. Um, again, like, you know, I think we all want to follow whatever worked for that person in hopes that it'll work for us, but you have to know yourself and your own habits and behaviors. Exactly. Um, and the other thing I've seen is people that have like lost a lot of weight with OMAD, you know, that's helped them get the weight down. Like you were saying, people who are just um, metabolically mm -hmm. unhealthy, it can kind of outweigh um, the risk and outweigh or the benefit can outweigh the risk of doing yeah. it. But then they've kind of reached goal weight or gotten close to it and they are not seeing results anymore. It's almost as though um, the body and the metabolism is kind of like revolting against the chronic fasting and that chronic stress of, yeah. um, of doing that one meal a day also. And so they're yeah. either gaining weight or they've just totally like plateaued out. Yeah. And when our body is under a lot of stress, we're more likely to create visceral fat, which is that belly fat that nobody wants to have. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's easy to tap into. So our body is like, when, you know, when the cortisol is always high, glucose is always high with stress, it's because our body's like, you need energy for whatever stressor is going on. So it also starts to create more visceral fat because that's easier energy to tap into. So if, if you're gaining fat, but you're in a calorie restriction or you're only eating one meal a day, it could be that you're overstressed for sure. Yeah. I see that all the time. <laughs>